All right, it's uh, good to be here with the church family of Calvary Chapel LAX. Uh, the last time I was here, it was in August, and uh, it was a Sunday morning, and it was a pleasure and a blessing. At that time, Pastor Justin wasn't here, and so when I saw him show up, I was all like, okay, did I come on the wrong day, or, or what's going on here? And then when he said, oh, no, he's going to stay. And I was like, okay, is he critiquing my teaching? What's going on here? I don't work for the guy. What's happening here? And No, you know what? The Lord is preparing, as God is preparing the work that he's going to do here in the next couple of weeks. It's just a time. And I want to encourage you, the church family, I want to encourage you to be on your knees, to be on your faces before the Lord regarding your pastor and the leadership as they continue to seek him, that they continue to hear from him. It was a blessing to hear him say when uh, so many other pastors were saying they're going to do it and, and he wasn't feel led. The, the pressure was there, but... That's a man who doesn't fear man. It's a man who fears the Lord. And so you be blessed that you have a pastor who fears the Lord and seeks the Lord and stand in the gap with him and for him and for the leadership here at the church. So it's my pleasure again to be here tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke's Gospel. And we're going to be in Luke's Gospel, chapter 24 this evening. Luke chapter 24. You know, when this whole... COVID things started. I, I don't know about you, but it was really a weird time and a weird situation for me because my wife and I, we're very sociable people. We are constantly out. And if you follow us on our Instagram and, and social media, it's like, I kid you not, in the morning, we can start out in Moreno Valley and in the afternoon, we can be somewhere in the desert of the mountains. And by the evening time, we're out somewhere by the ocean. And, and then later on that night, we're at a birthday party all in one day. And, and people are like, I, I just, we just can't keep up with you. And we're just like, that's okay. This is what God has called us to do. We love being around people. So when we were in our home for a good length of time, God's grace just, I think, showered us. And here we are, just husband and wife in a home, and, and, and my counseling had ramped up. I had, I'm sure like every other pastor and teacher out there, I was probably doing anywhere from five to six counseling sessions a day uh, with husbands and wives. But the Lord had done something really special in, in my wife and I. And I could honestly say this. We, in that time, had an encounter with the Lord that radically changed who we were. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, this personal encounter with the Lord. And I'm not talking about becoming born again, but I'm talking about as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, I think sometimes we as Christians, we can get off track or we can get caught in a rut or a routine. We can uh, have Jesus figured out in our head and figure out this is just the way it's supposed to be. But there are times that I believe as God steps out of heaven to the person of Jesus Christ, through the moving of the Holy Spirit, wants to have a personal encounter with us, get us realigned with Him, break our will to His will, and radically change who we are. And tonight, we're going to read about the story of two men that encountered Jesus in a way that radically changed who they are. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to open it up here in Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13. And it says, Now behold... Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went to them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Whenever I teach the word, I try to always do my best, especially when I'm teaching one of the narratives, is to put you there of the time of the story. So humor me, if you will, and go back with me some 2,000 years. It is the Sunday morning. Two days before this, Jesus had been taken. He had been arrested. He had been unjustly tried. They beat him. They whipped him. They shoved a crown of thorns into his head and then eventually nailed him to a cross. And there, after he had died, they buried him into a tomb. And here we are some two days later, early Sunday morning, there's the scurrying of, and the noise and the, and, and the rumors that he's not in the tomb. And try to put yourself in the place of the disciples of Jesus, the followers of Jesus. 
They just saw the future as they believed and as they saw it, the future Messiah, the one who was going to redeem them, give them back the nation of Israel, get rid of the Roman government, the one they saw who had healed and performed miracles, who had had such a great following, a leader like they had never seen before. And now he was dead. And all of their hopes that they had put in him were dashed. And now here we are Sunday morning. He's not in the cave. He's not there. He's no longer in the tomb. Where did he go? Well, some say that there were angels there, and the angels said they had risen, and then you had the testimony of the women. I thought it was interesting that Dr. Luke put the testimony of the women in there because understanding the culture of that time, the testimony of women had no value. So if this had gone to court about the, the, the revealing of the angels telling them that Jesus no, was no longer in the tomb, that the women's testimony would have not even been allowed. And yet we have these rumblings and we have the, these rumors and we have the stirring of the heart. Peter and John and James I, and all of them, they, they were heartbroken and only to hear, he's not there. And only to remember the words that Jesus said. And so they had to go see it for themselves. Confusion. Heartbreak. What's going on? And then Dr. Luke takes us to these two men right here. It's almost as, as though the story steps away from what's going on in Jerusalem and it zeroes in on these two men here. And it says of them that they were on the road traveling to Emmaus. It's a seven mile journey. On average, it can take anywhere from two to three hours depending on how fast you're walking. It was a road that was commonly traveled between Jerusalem and Emmaus. And as they were walking, it said what? That they talked among themselves reasoning about what happened. There's a good guess that the conversation went something like this. What happened? This Jesus that we've been following, this one who, who was supposed to be the Messiah, we heard and we saw the miracles. He, he was the one that fit the mold of what the Messiah was going to do when he came. He's the one that we, what happened? And as they were walking and talking along the way, as they were discouraged, grieved, Jesus joins them in this conversation. Again, it wasn't like these were the only two guys on the road and then Jesus happened to just pop in. But no, people may have been traveling back and forth. It was early Sunday morning. They may have been traveling from Emmaus to Jerusalem. But Jesus somehow at this point just comes alongside them. And it says in verse 16, but their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Now, it wasn't as though Jesus was incognito or he had maybe a, 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 something, a hood over his head and, 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 and had a covering over his face. But the language tells us that what? That he intentionally, supernaturally kept them from recognizing it was him. I, I wonder how many times the Lord, in a sense, sneaks into our lives doesn't reveal himself, and I'm talking about through his spirit, doesn't let us know, hey, the spirit of God is here, I sense it, I feel it, but peeks into our lives or steps into our lives without our knowledge to hear the things we're talking about, to hear the things we're thinking about, to see the things that we're doing, and we're not aware of it. These men were supernaturally blinded by that. And then it goes on and it says, And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? He may have been walking with them for a while. He may have been walking side by side right behind them, enough to hear what they were saying. And now he inserts himself into their conversation. He inserts himself into their very lives. And yet they had no idea what they were about to encounter. This idea of them being sad. The translation tells us that it would give, they, that they had a sad and gloomy countenance. It wasn't that they were just sad inwardly, but outwardly. Outwardly, they showed that they were heartbroken by what happened. The Messiah, the Deliverer, the one who was going to redeem his people was now dead. 
But now, we don't even know where his body is. They said it resurrected. They said the angels, but we don't know because they had not seen the resurrected Lord at that time. I want to encourage you with something. Because it's in those deep and dark, hurting times in our lives is when God wants to step in. He doesn't want to just make you feel good, nor does he necessarily want to take the pain away. But he wants to be invited into the midst of where we are. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the fire? And then Nebuchadnezzar sees the fourth one in there, like the son of man, he said. If it, if it was me and I was in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'd say, Lord, get me out of here. But the Lord came and visited them in the midst of where they were. And even in the fire, he protected them. He comforted them. And I wonder how many times we, we want the Lord to do magic things to make us feel better versus inviting him into the pain of where we are. Isn't that what our brother Paul said? When the Holy Spirit speaking through him and Paul said in Philippians 3.10, he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I want Christ to be in the midst of it with me. I want to invite him in and he wants to be in. And I love how Jesus just inserted himself in there. And he said, hey, what's going on? What am, what am I hearing? You guys sound heartbroken. And not only do you sound heartbroken, but... You look like you're hurting as well, too. It goes on in verse 18, and it says, Then one of, uh, excuse me, then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem, and have you not known the things which have happened in these days? In, in, in our vernacular today, it would sound something like this if we were in that conversation. Are you kidding me? But have you been living under a rock? Don't you know what's going on? How could you not hear about the things? Uh, look how fast today, in our culture, in our time, information gets out through social media. And so that would have been the same reaction to Jesus had it been today. It would have been, are you kidding me? Don't you look at Twitter? Aren't you watching the news? Haven't you seen your Instagram? Don't you know what's going on? And, and you can tell, again, they were genuinely concerned that Jesus wasn't understanding, that Jesus wasn't getting that was going on. And so it goes on there in verse 19, and we'll continue to read. It says, and he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and, and word before God and, and all the people. And now the chief priest, our rulers, delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they said, what? They said that he did, they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us to the tomb and found it. Excuse me. Certain of those went with us to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. It was after Jesus had asked this question, what are you guys talking about? Why are you so gloomy in countenance? And it was though Cleopas had all of this inside of him, this hurt, this turmoil, this confusion, this misunderstanding, and it was though he was just dumping it just dumping it all on Jesus as it was though he could not contain it anymore. The pressure of trying to figure out what's going on. We couldn't understand this. And, and I, and I want to see if you caught this because he says there in verse 21, but we were hoping. We were hoping that he was going to be the one. At this point, for Cleopas and his friend, and perhaps for the disciples and the others that followed Jesus, they all had lost hope. They had, in a sense, given up. I had shared at a funeral today, a 
funeral of a man who I had the blessed opportunity to lead to the Lord just a few days before he passed away. And today, at his funeral, I had shared out of 1 Peter chapter 1, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has begotten us again to a living hope. Speaking of our inheritance that lies in heaven waiting for us. And I shared with the people there at the funeral about this living hope. This word living hope means a confident expectation. These men had a certain idea of who Jesus was or who he was supposed to be to them. And when Jesus, in their mind and in their eyes, did not meet that expectation, they had lost hope. I wonder how many of us have experienced that in our relationship with the Lord. We have this certain expectation. We have this certain idea of who Jesus is supposed to be. Again, let's go back and let's see what they say. There at 19, it says, So they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the peoples, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him into the, and condemned him to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. We thought he was the one. And they had a certain idea about Jesus. And then when, that, when he died, that took away their hope. I am blessed, and I am so blessed by the opportunity that I have as a pastor to be a counseling pastor. And what I mean by that is God has opened the doors with me and several Calvary Chapel churches to do counseling for many of the people in their church. I've been blessed to be able to spend time with a wonderful man by the name of Dr. Charles Browning, who is a godly man and a biblical counselor, who has trained me over the past five, six years in this area of biblical counseling and therapy. I only share that with you because over the years in counseling, I have found out that people have a certain expectation, ideas about Jesus and God and how Jesus and God are supposed to work in their lives for them. And then when he doesn't meet their expectations, they give up. They become angry. They're heartbroken. They give up hope. Jesus could have easily, he could have easily appeared to these men. They knew what he looked like. They had spent time. These were disciples of Jesus. These were men who had followed Jesus in the three years of his ministry. And I believe that Jesus did not reveal himself in the very beginning, which he could have. He could have said, look, guys, don't be discouraged. I'm resurrected. I'm alive. But I think... I think they needed, in a sense, to confess their ideas, their perceptions, their understandings, their expectations of how they thought Jesus was going to work in their lives so that he, in turn, and I'll say it this way, can straighten them out. So here we are. Cleopas is answering Jesus' question. And again, the way the original language reads, it's as though he's just dumping it all on him. I cannot contain this anymore. The emotions in me are so heavy and so hard that, here, I'm just going to dump it all on you. Jesus, we thought he was going to be this way. We thought he was the redeemer. And then they came and they killed him, and it just doesn't make any sense. I think it's important that we as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters in the Lord, I think it's important that we learn how to cast our cares upon him. I think it's important that we do come to Jesus and stop carrying this heavy load that we are not designed to carry. Again, so many times in counseling, so many times people who come in with heavy burdens on their heart, heavy concerns, and the burdens and the concerns become so much heavier when they try to figure it out themselves when they try to answer all the questions, when they try to use reason and logic to make something make sense versus just coming and saying, Lord, here, I can't deal with this. I love what the Holy Spirit speaking to the Apostle Peter says there in, in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your cares upon him, 
This idea of casting all our cares upon him. Sometimes we, we, when we teach it, we put such a focus on just give it to Jesus, just give it to Jesus. But again, in the language, it is the focus is on the one who is capable of bearing it. And that's him. You and I are not designed, not in this fallen body. We are not designed to carry these heavy burdens, these, these unrealized expectations, these unmet hopes and promises, broken dreams and broken hearts. We were not meant to carry the burdens. Moms and dads, we were not meant to carry the burdens of our children as they are slowly walking away from the Lord, perhaps in rebellion. Husbands and wives, we were not meant to carry the burden of perhaps our, our spouse turning their back on us and walking away. We were not meant to carry the burdens that fear and anxiety came about through everything that we've been experiencing these past few months. It wasn't for us to carry. Jesus is capable of bearing the full weight of what we try to carry around. And that's why the Holy Spirit, speaking through Peter, says what? Cast, throw, get rid of, boom, because he can carry it. Doesn't the Lord say, take my yoke and learn of me? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. God says, I have something so much easier for you to wear, and I have something so much lighter for you to carry. You give me that. I'll give you this. And so we see that displayed here. We see this man just kind of give it all to Jesus. I can't take it anymore. It doesn't make any sense. And he cast all his burden there upon the Lord. And now we see the Lord's response, and we see what God is going to do in, in all of this. Let's, let's pick it back up here in, in verse 22, and we'll, we'll continue to read through. Verse 22, it says, Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ had to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. There's a verse in the Bible that makes reference to that God straightens out the crooked places in our paths. God's the one who real, realigns our will to his will. And I may have certain expectations about God and, and, and certain ideologies about Jesus, and, and I may even get caught up in doctrine and theology. But what the Lord is desiring most for us is a personal encounter with him. And in that personal encounter, he's going to straighten out the crooked places. He's going to align our will to his will. And that's why it says here that what? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He said, hey, you know what? You guys were right about the idea of, of me redeeming. But let me explain to you what that redemption was all about. Yes, 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 I did come. And, and, and yes, I was going to do these things. But you guys are looking at a much smaller picture when there's a greater picture in all of this. I, I've been a Christian uh, since 1981. And I got saved. Back then it was called Calvary Chapel, West Covina. Pastor Raul, was the, Raul Reese was the pastor of that church. And and, and all I knew about Christianity is what Pastor Rawl taught. And then I learned about Christianity, what Pastor Chuck taught, or, or, or Skip, or any of these other guys. In fact, I remember even growing up as a Christian, quoting Pastor Chuck, Pastor Rawl, uh, Pastor Skip, and a lot of these, quoting them before quoting the Bible. Well, Chuck said this, and, 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 and Rawl said this. But the Lord had 
revealed to me my heart one day, and he says, but what am I saying about it? That, that, that's, that, that's fine what they're saying, but what am I saying about it? I'm like, I don't know, Lord. And he said, why don't you and I spend time in my word and let me realign your thinking, your thoughts about me, your understanding. Let me realign them so that you, under, you understand me the way I want you to understand me. And over the course of my life as a Christian, there have been those seasons where God stepped into my life and realigned me, straightened out the crooked places, times in hope, hopelessness, times of despair, when I thought all was lost, he would always step in. And in those times, and I, and I will never forget those moments and those seasons and those times where he stepped in to the conversation with me and the thoughts that I was having in my own head and revealed himself and straightened himself out in my life because I had a misunderstanding about him. And we need that. We need that encounter from the Lord. Listen, for those of, for those of you that know me, know me well, I, I, I'm all about doctrine and theology. I, I'm, I'm a Christian apologist. Those things matter so much to me, but this is something the Lord has shown me just in the past couple of years. He says, hey, Mark, when you get to heaven, you're not going to take a test on doctrine and theology. How well did you know my son? How well did you allow my son in and radically transforming and changing who you are so that he can be glorified through your life? How well did you invite him in to every area and every moment of your life versus just saying, Lord, take it away because I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And I find that the older I get, especially in my relationship with the Lord, I want him in every part of it. I don't want to have to cry out to him later because I got myself in trouble. I want him to be with me. I want to have the mindset. I heard somebody say, I want to be like the little lamb that keeps his nose to the hem of the shepherd's garment. If he moves, I move with him. If he doesn't, I stay right there. I let him feed me. I let him watch over me. I let him protect me. I let him lead me. But he can't and he won't. If I stay locked into what I think Jesus should be, I think how he should perform or act in my life, that's never going to happen. And, and let's look at the response of these guys because it was something that, that was very powerful. As I said, these guys had lost hope. And now Jesus, going through the scriptures, going through his word and speaking to them, hey, you know, when, when this happened here, when, when, when here in Genesis, when you read the promise of the serpent and, and the child, that's me. Hey, you, you, read, you remember the stories of, of the sacrifices and, and the lamb? That's me. The one who's going to redeem not just Israel, but mankind, that's me. And he corrected all of this thinking and all his ideas and things that they had in their head. And he wanted to make sure that they understood. I came to restore man back to the Father. To put man back into that right relationship. And now we're going to see the response and everything that had happened here in verse 28. He said, then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now when it had come to pass, as they sat at the table with them, then he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Uh, let me just stop here for a moment. So this conversation, whether it started just right out of Jerusalem, halfway, but we know at least minimum two, three hours, this, this walk, this seven-mile journey, Jesus had taken over the conversation. He inserted himself into their lives, and he, he realigned their thinking about who he was. Now they come to their house, and most likely it was Cleopas' home, and as they, they come to his home, Jesus kind of gives the indicator that he's going to keep on walking. I believe that Jesus obviously knew where their house was. I believe Jesus' desire, what, that he wasn't going to keep on walking. 
But he was going to see from them, hey, are they going to invite me in? Not to just know about, but are they going to invite me in? And they signaled to him and they said, wait a minute, stay with us. In fact, the word they use there is to constrain. That word constrain, it's almost as though they pulled Jesus by, Jesus by his arm. Perhaps put, his arm, put their arms around his shoulder and said, no, you're staying with us. And he stayed with them. When was the last time you invited Christ in? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about just inviting him in. Lord, I want to know more about you. Lord, I want to spend more time with you. You know, when I, when I go through the word, I don't, I don't, this is me. The Lord has changed me in how I do things. I was one of those guys that used to try to do a chapter a day and, and try to get through it and everything. And then the Lord just changed me. He said, hey, why don't you hang out in this section for a little while? Why don't you just hang out and watch what I share with you about me, my character, my nature. Watch what I reveal to you about you. Your anxieties, your fears, your rebellions, your fear of man, whatever it may be. Let me reveal things to you about you. And so I've learned that as I go through the word and as I invite the Lord into the word with me, I say, Lord, do not let me leave this area until I know you better than when I first jumped in. If you look at one of my old Bibles, you'll see that in Galatians and Ephesians and Colossians and in that area right there in Philippians, that's the dirtiest part of my Bible because I spent months there. I spent weeks in just one chapter because, Lord, I don't want to leave this until I get what you want me to get out of it. He wants to be invited in. You're, not, you're all familiar with the scripture. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, I will come in and have fellowship. I will dine with you. I will commune with you. And a lot of times when we hear that passage, it's read or it's taught in a way, what? As a salvation invitation. But remember, Jesus is speaking to one of the churches. He's speaking to a believing church. And there are times that God wants to be invited into our lives to the point that he'll knock on the door. He'll let you know he's there. And how many times are we having discussions or having conversations or, or going through things in our own head and our own mind and, and we're struggling and, and we're praying, oh, Lord, take this away and Lord, fix that and, and Lord, change my heart and remove these feelings. And, and meanwhile, there's a knock at the door. Most of us now, we have apps on our phones that tell us who's at the door, so we don't have to answer it, right? But I get this picture. I'm, I'm a very visual guy, so I get this picture. My wife and I, we could be having an argument. We can be having a discussion, and, and, and I could be praying in my mind, Lord, she's wrong, tell her she's wrong. And she could be praying in her mind, he's wrong, tell him he's right. And I'm just like, Lord, what do we do? And he's knocking at the door. Hey, if you just let me come in, I'm going to show you a much better way of handling this. I'm going to show you a much better way of dealing with it. In fact, if you get out of the way, I'll do it through you. But you've got to invite me in. He doesn't just come into our hearts that one time through the Spirit. He wants to be invited in in every area of our lives. And that's what these men did here. They invited him. They constrained him. They said, come abide with us. That means to be present, to remain as one. And then Jesus does something radical here. He does just something so out of the ordinary because let's just say it was Cleopas' home. He would have been responsible. It was his house, so it would have been his cultural responsibility, what? To serve his guest. But Jesus does something crazy here. It says what in verse 30? It says, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. He took on the role of the master. And that's the role he wants to take on in your life, the role of the master. Listen, Jesus should never be our, our Santa Claus or our genie, the one that we go to when we want something. Jesus himself said what? You can't serve two masters. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. Your flesh, yourself, your sin nature, the world, the enemy, all of those are vying for your allegiance. They want to be Lord over your heart and over your will. And guess what? So does the Spirit of God. 
And Jesus wants that role of master in your life. Because the word says we are his slaves, we're his servants. And he took on that role. He, the, the Cleopas should have done it, or the other man, whoever's house it was. But Jesus took on that role. And, and you almost get the idea there, as he begins to break the bread, as he begins to, to pass it out, you almost get the idea of, of him reenacting something that happened just a few days before that. The Last Supper, Jesus serving, ministering to them, washing their feet. And it was the heart of a servant. It was that very act. That God at that moment knew that these men were now in the right place to reveal to them who this was. Their hearts were primed. They had been humbled. They, 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 had, they had, in a sense, surrendered to the understanding of God the right way because Jesus had straightened it all out for them. And it says what? That their eyes were opened, they knew him, and what? And then he vanished. As quickly as he just appeared into their lives, he was gone. But, but look at their responses. It says there in verse 32, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures? Once they realized it was Jesus, they knew that there was something going on. Even when they didn't recognize him, as he was explaining to them, his true identity of why he came and who he was and what his role was. Something inside of them was just stirring up. And isn't that how it is? When God begins to reveal himself to us and we submit to that revelation, there's something that stirs up in us. I say it like this. I just can't get enough. I want more. Lord, let's keep going. Let, let's keep reading here. Let's keep, and then the, sometimes the Lord will say, no, I got something else for you to do. And I'm like, Lord, are you sure? Let's just stay here. I, I, I'm like Peter and the boys when, 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 when Jesus took them there to the mountaintop. Remember and Moses and Elijah came? Hey, Lord, can't we just hang out here all night with these guys? This is awesome. This is like the coolest thing. No, I've got something else for you. I think sometimes it's important that we understand as Christians that Jesus didn't come into our lives to give us, but please don't take offense when I say this, the warm fuzzies. He didn't come into our lives just to make us feel good. Uh, there's a great book, if you, ever get, if you could ever get a hold of it. It's written by a man ma named Major Ian Thomas, and the name of the book is called The Saving Life of Christ. And in the first chapter, and in the first paragraph, he says, Christ did not come and simply die for your sins or to wash from stain away but to prepare your lives, or he says, to prepare the divine decks for divine action. God wants to use our lives. When we're wholly surrendered to him and we understand what that means, now he's ready to use our lives. What? So that he can be glorified through us. In other words, we're not meant to just, hey, keep it all to ourselves. These two guys... They could have just said, hey, man, he visited us. He didn't, he didn't reveal himself to the other apostles. That, he walked with us for these number of hours on the road to, to our city. He came and said, he served us. No, they could have stuck with that. But they knew God had something greater for them. In fact, look what it says. Uh, verse 32 again. Uh, and did they not say to one another again, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened up, excuse me, opened the scriptures to us? So they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. These men were so excited and so stirred up that they got back on the road and went for that seven-mile walk. This time, I'm sure it was shorter. I'm sure it didn't take two to three hours. Maybe they ran, but I guarantee you there was such excitement in them. You know, during the whole time of, of being on timeout with COVID and, you know, when, when they were letting us, at least in the Riverside County, you know, okay, you can leave your houses and go for walks. Get out into the sun. My, my wife and I would go on walks, and she really loves to walk, and I don't. And we went on some long walks, and when we came home, 
if my wife would say, let's go on that walk again, I'd say, you're crazy. No, go take the walk by yourself. I'm not going. And, and she would take me out on these three, four, five-mile walks. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to go back out. These guys, they were so excited. They got back on the road, and they went out. Most of us, hey, I encountered Jesus. I'm cool. Let's just leave it at that. No. God wants to stir our hearts. He wants to stir something up in us so that we go and preach and let others know what God has done. And so they get to the city, and they, they're there with the 11, and all the others were around, and it says this, and it says, verse 34, saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, and they told, excuse me, and they told about the things that had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So as these guys get back, they come to, to Peter and, and, and James and all the other guys. They come back, and they're getting ready to tell their story, and all of a sudden, they start hearing the testimony of others. Wait, he appeared to Simon. Yeah, he appeared to these guys too. And then these guys, so excited, jumped in and said, yes, and he appeared to us as well. He walked with us on the road, and then he, he stopped off at our house, and, and we had a meal together. He served us. And now we are hearing the confirmation of the work of God in their lives. Again, God didn't just save us so we can keep it all to ourselves. No, he saved us to free us from the power and the bondage of sin. What? So we can go out and tell others. Our testimony, our testimony is so much greater and so huge. Listen, I I can quote Bible scriptures all day at people. I can stand and share the gospel and, and Romans this and John that and everything. And for some people, man, it's just going to fly right over their head. But when I share the power of what Christ has done in me, and not only that, what Christ is doing through me, that's going to impact people's lives. Our testimony. I I believe every single one of us should have a a, a three to five minute testimony always ready to go. And I'm not necessarily talking about, oh, the days of old when I got saved. But what's God doing in your life today? Today. If you had to stand before a group of people and give a three to five minute testimony of what God is doing in your life today, would you be able to do it? Or or would you have to reach back way in the days when you got saved? Because see, you haven't been inviting him in. You haven't been allowing him to realign your will to his will. You haven't been allowing him to speak to you so that you have the correct understanding of who he is. Because when that happens, that my brothers and sisters, is the game changer in your life. These men could not help but go out and share what they saw in Jesus. And perhaps tonight, perhaps tonight you're in that place. You know Jesus. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. But to him, he's doctrine, he's theology, or He's he's the one that you want him to fix this and fix that for you. But you're not willing to humble yourself before him. Allow him to, to straighten out the crooked places in your thought life, in your heart life, in your physical life. And you're keeping him at bay. It's said of the children of Israel in, in, in uh, uh, Psalm 78, 41, that they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. How do you limit God? In fact, another translation says they frustrated God because God wanted to do so much for them, but they put God in this box and said, no, this is how I expect you to do it in my life. I believe, especially now, more than ever, we all need that personal encounter with him like we've never had before. It could start right where you are. You invite him in. You invite him into your thought life. You invite him into your heart life. You invite him into your life as you live it out. Lord, what do you want to do in me? What do you want to reveal to me? What crooked places do you want to straighten out? Lord, what are the misunderstandings I have about you? And how do you want to work it out so I understand you properly? And that that personal encounter with him radically changes who you are that you can't stop yourself from letting others know who Christ is, what he's done for you, and what he desires to do through you. Amen? Why don't you join me in a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for the opportunity tonight 
to bring forth your word and your message and your exhortation to your sons and daughters here. Lord, that we wouldn't be caught up in religion, but we would be caught up in you through relationship. That we wouldn't leave you on the other side of the door, wishing and hoping that you would take care of things in our lives, but we would invite you in. And Lord, any misunderstanding, any, any misguidance we have about who we think you are and how we think you should be doing things, Lord, we invite you in to straighten us out. Straighten out those crooked places in our minds and in our hearts and in our lives. And above all, Lord, that everything that we say and do glorifies and honors you. You in us, you through us. Father, bless the church family of Calvary Chapel LAX. Pray, Lord, as they, be, as they get ready to gather together in just a couple of weeks, Lord. Father, it is my prayer that you would stir the hearts of the fellowship here. So that first day they come back, Lord, there are stories of radical personal encounters with you. We pray for Pastor Justin, Lord. Continue to pour your spirit upon him. Give him your wisdom in discernment. Keep him in a place of brokenness and humility, Lord. So it's you in him and you through him. Lord, we thank you and praise you. And it's in your son's name. Amen. All right, bless you, and I thank you for the opportunity of teaching and ministering to all of you.